By the way, we can now begin to draw a qualitative graph of the phase velocity of light in optical materials as a function of frequency. In vacuo, it has the same value for all frequencies. We call it C. But in an optical material, the dipoles resonate to some frequency, F0. If the light incident on it has a frequency quite a bit below F0, the resultant signal, which is represented by the white phase or, lags only a bit behind in phase. Compared to C, the phase velocity is reduced only a small amount by the material. But when we use light of higher frequency, the phase lag as first increases. The speed of light in the material falls further below C. When the material is glass, this is the frequency range for visible light. Glass refracts blue light more than red light. It has a resonance in the near ultraviolet. If a beam of white light falls obliquely on a glass surface, blue is bent more than red. As we increase frequency further toward the resonance value F0, the phase delay reaches a maximum and then it decreases. Correspondingly, the phase speed goes through a minimum. Finally, at resonance, the phase lag in the total disturbance is zero. The speed rises again, reaching C at resonance as if we had a vacuum. Notice also how small the white phaser is at resonance. Very little light gets through. In other words, near F0, the material absorbs the light. It is opaque there or nearly so. If some of these conclusions are a surprise to you, wait, we are in for more surprises when we consider the conditions for light of even higher frequencies. As you remember, an oscillator will lag even more behind the driving force above resonance. So, for these higher frequencies, the dipole wave will lag behind even more than at F0. From resonance on upward, the dipole wave's phase delay increases from 180 to 270 degrees. Above resonance, the dipole oscillators respond with lower amplitude again, so the phaser representing the dipole wave would shorten as we think of larger and larger frequencies. The resultant signal grows in amplitude. The material is again transparent. But even more importantly, notice that the resultant wave signal, which at the resonance F0 was in phase with the incident signal, now leads it. What was a phase lag below F0 now is a phase lead above. The phase of light moves faster than C through the medium. Phase velocity can exceed the speed of light in free space. Keep in mind that only the resultant wave's phase moves faster than C. The individual dipole waves, the incident wave, all these waves move from atom to atom through the intervening space at speed C. No signal actually moves faster than C. Our curve is called a dispersion curve. It tells the story about what happens to light in the neighborhood of a frequency where its medium has a resonant response. Below resonance, the phase of light moves more slowly than in vacuo, and a beam obliquely incident on the material will be bent toward the normal. Near resonance, the material is opaque. Above resonance, an obliquely incident beam should be bent away from the normal. Yes. That must be true, because we just saw that above resonance, the wave has a phase velocity which is larger than in vacuo. Still, you might be skeptical, so we'll check it by experiment. We need two things. First of all, we need a material whose atoms or molecules have a resonance in some range of wavelengths. Secondly, we have to make a prism out of this material. Now, let's suppose the material's resonance lies in the yellow region of the visible spectrum. The wavelengths of red light 
are longer than yellow. So the red frequencies lie below the resonance in the yellow. Red light will be refracted downward by the prism. The frequencies of light on the blue side of yellow lie above the resonance. Green light will be refracted upward by a prism whose material resonates in the yellow. Its phase velocity is larger than C in the material. So this is the effect we should look for. I plan to make our prism out of the hot vapor of sodium metal. Sodium vapor can be made to radiate strongly at a natural frequency in the yellow region of the spectrum. Let me show you. I'm cutting some small pieces of sodium. Let me put one on a little platform above this burner. When sufficiently heated, sodium vapor will glow bright yellow. Exactly the same radiation is produced in a sodium lamp by an electric discharge. In our next experiment, we'll take a look at the spectrum of the light from heated sodium vapor. For this purpose, I've set up a glass prism spectroscope over here. Our sodium lamp is the light source. And with the help of a condenser lens in here, it illuminates a vertical slit. The light from this slit is collimated by another lens, and just beyond it, I have a little platform on which I'll mount this prism. Actually, it's a series of three prisms. Together, they form a good dispersive element for visible light. But the dispersed light is sent generally forward, which a single prism would not do. A so-called direct view prism. It's quite convenient. I'll make a movie of the sodium spectrum with this camera. The light comes in narrow wavelength bands. We see slit images in different colors. The brightest spectral line is yellow. Here you see our spectroscope again. But this time, the light source is a carbon arc. 